Thank you, Javon. Lovely. We welcome you to worship this morning here at First United Methodist Church. If you're visiting with us, I hope you'll find your way to the patio and there'll be someone there after the service that can assist you with information about the church. I would invite you to find one of the little cards there in the pew, the I Am Here card, and would you please fill in the information there and also any prayer requests you can put on the uh, other side of the card. Uh, this is one of those unusual years when uh, the Reign of Christ Sunday or Christ the King Sunday comes after Thanksgiving. So it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit of an adjustment. Advent is normally the first Sunday after Thanksgiving, but this year it will be next Sunday. This means that all of you probably are still uh, suffering from an overexposure to turkey. Uh, my uh, children and grandchildren all gathered here in San Diego. They decided the weather might be better than Chicago. <laughs> and uh, we had a lovely time. Uh, I will tell you that on Friday, they wanted to see the church. And I texted the facilities manager ahead of time to let him know we were coming but he didn't get the message in time, so when we unlocked the sanctuary door, well, let me just say this. You don't want four grandchildren running around in an alarmed building. <laughs> and uh, I thought for a while I was going to have to call Jason Tucker to bail me out of jail, but uh, uh, we managed to make it and have a wonderful time, even surviving Legoland earlier. Last Sunday, some of you may have noticed, I announced that uh, the flowers on the altar were not the same as those printed in the bulletin. Uh, Demi says I should blame her, but I'll take responsibility as well. Uh, the flowers on the 18th were given by Ken Asik and Sherry Carroll in honor of the 25th wedding anniversary on November 20th and by Joanna Fuller and Dan Fuller in honor of the 50th wedding anniversary of their parents, Keith and Gail Fuller. That was last Sunday, this Sunday. Altar flowers are given by Roger Schaefer in memory of his wife, Margaret, who died November 26, five years ago, and Dick and Jerry Eimers in memory of Dick's mother, Helen Gar Helene Garrett, who died on November 9th. I think we're caught up now in altar flowers and our apologies. Uh, you'll notice the prayer quilts are for John Herman and Mary Sawarski. And I want to remind you then that next Sunday evening and the following Monday, the day after, you can come and hear a remarkable concert. I think this only happens every five years or so. And uh, you won't want to miss it. Uh, symphony orchestra, choirs, it will be a wonderful uh, presentation of Handel's Messiah. So, 7 o'clock next Sunday and Monday evenings. Uh, we also can use some ushers on that evening if you want to let the office know, and also can use some ushers on um, Christmas Eve. I'm going to now ask Bonnie Swartz if she would share uh, a word from the Pastor Parish Committee. Good morning, everyone. Your Pastor Parish Relations Committee really wants to thank all of you for the thoughtfully crafted responses that many, many of you sent to us. Those responses and comments have been summarized with the detail provided to the bishop. <coughs> Excuse me. He has greatly appreciated our suggestions. Bishop Hagia will be looking nationally for the very best person available who is in sympathy with our Wesleyan traditions and who brings leadership qualities needed to serve First Church in the years ahead. Currently, the bishop is in the process of reaching out to colleague bishops, national church leaders, and others to identify such persons with significant leadership potential. Early in the new year, the PPRC bishop and district superintendent will engage in careful consultation as to the attributes of our desired next pastor. The direction and opportunities emerging in the life of the congregation and how to work with the bishop in a consultative fashion during this time of discernment. 
Potential future pastors will not be preaching before the congregation prior to the appointment. At the recommendation of the bishop, the potential new lead pastor will meet with the PPRC. Following a successful meeting with the PPRC, an announcement will be made by the bishop, followed by an appointment and introduction to the congregation. This may occur in late winter or early spring. Our new lead pastor will be officially appointed to our church at the annual conference in June and will begin the appointment on July 1st, 2019. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie, for your good work and the work of the Pastor Parish Relations Committee. Uh, one other bit of good news. Uh, we learned this week that we have now surpassed 90% of our stewardship goal. Uh, we're just uh, almost there. Uh, Jason tells me we're on the 10 yard line and uh, that's very good. About 360 pledges, we're looking for 50 or 60 more. And uh, please, if you haven't made a pledge and are open to doing so, help us out by doing that this week uh, because we would like uh, to have the budget all wrapped up for meetings next weekend. Uh, the meetings next weekend are on Saturday at 9 o'clock. The church council will be meeting in the Cove. And on Sunday at 1230, we'll have a charge conference meeting in the Cove, and we'll hope to approve the budget and uh, some other matters at that time. So please continue to be generous, and thank you so very much for your support of this congregation. Um, and so it, the time has come. May the peace of Christ be with you. Please share the peace of Christ with your neighbors. And now if you'll remain standing, the choir will open our worship time with the entroit.
I invite you to join me in the invocation. Thou who art over us, thou who art one of us, thou who art, give me a pure heart that I may see thee, a humble heart that I may hear thee, a heart of love that I may serve thee, a heart of faith that I may abide in thee. Amen. I'd like to invite the children now to come forward to the chancel steps, and if there are any other children who'd like to come forward, parents, you're welcome to join them. We welcome them forward at this time.
Boo. <laughs> I'm back here today. Good morning, good morning. Hey, can you tell me what this is? It is a map. Yes, it is. I have in mind that we'll go on a quick treasure hunt today, so I brought this map of the church. Now, I also punched up on my phone. I have the church on Google Maps here. Now, I'm wondering, if I wanted you to go on a treasure hunt with me, which would you rather have, a map or your phone? How many of you would say, how many of you would say the map? A map? Okay, how many of you would say the phone? Uh-huh. Yeah. How many of you would say the map? Yeah, and how many of you would say, I, got, I figured that was the case? Well, guess what? Actually, I have an even better idea. I thought I would ask Miss uh, Priscilla to come and help. And would one of you want to go on a quick uh, treasure hunt with Miss Priscilla? Who would like to do that? Can I have a volunteer? Let me have, let's have uh, Ethan. Will you go on a quick treasure hunt with Miss Priscilla? Go ahead. Oh, up, 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 up. Stay with him. Did somebody steal my treasure? <laughs> ah. Can you bring it out to me? What's the treasure? Thank you very much. Come on over. Come on over. Ethan, what did you find? It looks like food. It is, it, is not a, it is not a candy, piece of candy, no. This, my friends, is an Advent candle. And next Sunday, we start the season of Advent, and every Sunday, we'll be lighting candles. Next Sunday is Christmas. We're not at Christmas yet, no. Advent, you've got to ad, gotta go through Advent before you get to Christmas. That's one of the rules, okay? <laughs> so listen, I wanted today, we'll talk about Advent next Sunday, but today I wanted you to think about this. Sometimes it's not really what you know or what you have, but it's more important who you know. I think that's what Jesus was talking about when he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. If we follow Jesus, Jesus will take us right where we need to go. Will you pray with me? Let us pray. God, thank you for sending Jesus to show us the way. We thank you that he is the truth and the life. So help us to follow Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. All right, now you can follow Miss Priscilla and your Sunday school teachers out to Sunday school, and let's sing the children out uh, with a song. Please be in an attitude of prayer. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Glory be to you, O Lord Most High. We ask for your blessing on this day of rest and refreshment. Let us rejoice today in your worship and be glad as we sing your praise. Let our spirit be refreshed today as well as our bodies. Many of us have recently enjoyed Thanksgiving with our friends and families. Many here have generously donated food and time to our loaves and fishes ministry. We ask for blessings for all who participated and prayers for the recipients that their futures will be changed for the better. Our need to eat, as described in the Gospel of John, in feeding of the 5,000, not only unites us all, but underscores a basic human frailty. This need to eat every few hours is true and unrelenting for each and every one of us, no matter how rich or poor, powerful or oppressed, weak or strong, it is an emblem of our humanness. We thank God who has created an infallible way to remind us daily that we are bound to and dependent on every other living thing in his universe 
a knowledge that is surely the ultimate blessing. Through the recent horrific fire in the community of paradise, in addition to the sheer magnitude of loss and grief, we have also witnessed generosity through faith and connection. We are grateful for the donations being sent by First Church to help assist the people who have been affected, as well as for all those who have given so generously. Dear Lord, help us to live with gratitude for the abundance that surrounds us. Encourage us to reach out to people who could use a kind word or encouragement. We pray for those who are unable to join us today and please give strength to those who are facing health and life challenges. May these beautiful prayer quilts bring comfort to John Herman and Mary Zwadzki. May they know the compassion and concern expressed with each knot tied for them in prayer. We pray for all those who are seeking you earnestly today. Be with us as we meet together in praise to magnify your name and lead them into life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen.
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. I'll be reading from John 18, 33 to 40. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king, Jesus answered. You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is the truth? The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, let me thank the choirs. Those were both wonderful anthems. And Timmy, what was that, a high G? A flat. I've got perfect pitch. So, wow, well done. Dear friends, it's Christ the King Sunday, and so we come to remember all that has passed through Pentecost, actually since last Easter, as we prepare for this day and next Sunday, the beginning of Advent. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in, our, in your sight, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It's a 2,000-year-old question, and it's still awaiting your answer this morning. The question asked two millennia ago is a query that has ricocheted across the social, cultural, philosophical, and political landscapes of time. It's the question Pilate asks of Jesus. What is truth? As Frederick Buechner 
has noted Jesus doesn't answer Pilate's question. He just stands there. He stands and stands there. What is truth? Bigner goes on, contrary to the traditional view that this question is cynical, it is possible that Pilate asks this with a lump in his throat. Instead of truth, Pilate is only seeking expediency. Pilate asks what is truth, and for years, politicians and scientists and theologians and philosophers and poets and so on have tried to tell him the sound they make, Beekner says, is like the sound of crickets chirping. Again and again, Jesus has modeled what truth might be. A truth was communicated not by words only, but by the actions of Jesus, by the way he calls his followers to live, his healing the sick, his welcoming the children, his eating with sinners, and welcoming those on the margins of society into the movement toward truth. Too often, talk isn't matched by actions. Donald English was a British Methodist pastor and he once noted, the world has enough salesmen of the gospel. What we need are more free samples. I remember Olive Anderson now there was a sample. By the time I met her, she was in her late 70s. She had lost most of her eyesight. We worshiped together in a downtown parish in Atlanta, Georgia. Her physical impairments did not slow her, however. She was active in prayer groups and women's groups and peace marches. She was amazing. There are two things I remember distinctly about Miss Anderson. The first is, she sang hymns lustily. She seemed to have memorized every word in, of every hymn in the hymnal. I know this because I often sat next to her or behind her, and she was often holding a hymnal open to the wrong page. <laughs> On a few occasions, I noticed it was upside down. Olive Anderson taught me much. Second thing I remember is the Sunday she spoke in worship. I did not know her history. The Andersons you see had spent most of their adult lives in China as missionaries. It is where they met as young people. Olive Lipscomb and Sid Anderson were married while home on furlough in 1920 in her mother's apartment in Nashville, Tennessee. They had the dean of Vanderbilt School of Theology come and perform the ceremony. For over three decades, they taught, preached, established healthcare programs, social programs that touched tens of thousands, listen to this, tens of thousands each week. As a matter of fact, Bob Pierce, who formed World Vision, did it based on what he saw there at Moore Memorial Church in Shanghai. Sid and Olive Anderson. I remember the Sunday she stood and talked a bit about her work and then she said these words, if God calls you to be a missionary, don't stoop to be a king. And then with her eyes dancing, this feminist said, or a queen. <laughs> I think of the Andersons every time I come to Christ the King Sunday. The line about not stooping to be a king or a queen has been attributed to many. However, if I ever met royalty in the Jesus movement, it would have been knowing folks like the Andersons. When we met them, we had an encounter with a, troop at a, a truth at a deep level. It was a truth, truth that was based on lives lived in service to Christ. We in the United States are a people who have sought to be freed of kings and queens. 
Our national identity is shaped by being separatists and even Protestants for many of us. I recall the time I was appointed to a new uh, congregation in Indianapolis, Indiana. A big sanctuary like this, only it was Gothic. Uh, stained glass windows and an aisle that I used to say to brides, you better pack a lunch to make it down that aisle. <laughs> I remember my son uh, came in the first time he saw it. He walked all the way down the center aisle, came in the chancel, and then he came to the pulpit. I was out here, and he looked at me, and he said, Dad, the Puritans wouldn't like this at all. <laughs> and he was right. You heard the report from Bonnie Swartz this morning. The Pastor Parish Relations Committee has been collecting characteristics and attributes desired for the next lead pastor from you, the congregation. Thank you for your many responses. You've provided many good ones. Some of them you've provided are contradictory. You've asked, for instance, for someone who is young with 30 years of experience. <laughs> you stopped just short of wanting someone who walks on water but some of you did seem to want someone who performs a dozen miracles by noon each day and two dozen on Sunday. There are some common attributes in those characteristics that have been passed on to the bishop, but there's one that I note, one that most frequently was stated in one fashion or another. It is that you want someone of integrity. I know the committee and bishop are taking your suggestions seriously. Here is something else I know. It may take a year or two or three years, but you will discover that the next lead pastor, sadly, is not perfect. You will discover that there are some things you don't appreciate, some attributes that you didn't think would be there. And you see, the goodness, the value of truth comes in relationships that you will develop together. There's one other thing I suspect many of you may have missed. It may take a year or two or three or maybe less, and the lead pastor will discover that you're not a perfect people. Here's the good news. You have seven months to work on improving. <laughs> Where there are patterns of distrust, gossip, conspiracy thinking, division, you have some time to work on these things. Jesus is silent. He just stands there. He's already given the answer about truth by how he has lived. Truth is discovered in right relationships more than in right answers. As Parker Palmer tells us, truth is mirrored more in relationships than captured in doctrines or laws. He says, in prayer, I begin to realize that I am not only known, but I am known. Truth is in relationship Palmer says, it's a commitment to a continuing eternal conversation. The hallmark of a community of truth is that it's claimed that reality is a web of communal relationships and we can know reality only by being in a community with it. Relationships are broken in so many ways. There are past wounds we all carry. We have different histories and family backgrounds. We struggle with different demons, pain, loneliness, childhood disappointments, alcoholism, betrayal, drug abuse, ideological and political differences. Any one of these is enough to undercut the truth of establishing a web of communal relationship. Palmer writes, the ancient human question, who am I, leads inevitably to a more important question, which is, whose am I? For there is no self outside 
of relationships. Currently in this nation, relationships are being tested. There is an undercutting of factual realities necessary to guarantee the discovery of truth in relationship. But hear this, facts are not truth. They're important toward truth, but no one fact is truth in itself. They must be sifted and afforded meaning in a context. Facts are necessary ingredients to building healthy relationships, but they're not the whole truth. Forty years ago, Hannah Arndt wrote, a people that no longer can believe anything cannot make up its mind. It is deprived not only of its capacity to act, but also of its capacity to think and judge. And with such people, you can then do what you please. Sid and Oliver Anderson knew this in ways many of us never will. In 1943, Sid was arrested and spent almost a year in a prison camp run by the Japanese. They both suffered deprivation and separation. Yet there was always, I am told, by people who knew them, a vibrancy about them. We knew them at the end of their lives. They had left behind a great legacy of Methodism as both a place of high piety and commitment and also a place committed to compassion and justice. Professor Carolyn Lewis of Luther Seminary notes, when kingdom is construed from the truth of relationship and not rule, from the truth of incarnation and not location, from the truth of love and not law, then Jesus' truth will ring true. The scene of Jesus before Pilate is poignant. He has been before the chief priests already. So much of this is dramatic. It tests our belief that the scriptures don't have a political element. This is a profoundly political scene. But Fred Craddock notes this. The real trial has already taken place. The real trial, you see, occurred before a charcoal fire when Peter is asked if he knew this Jesus. He is tried and found wanting. All of us are tried. We still face this 2,000-year-old question. Mrs. Anderson shows us a way forward. I think of others who've shown us the way of Christ, as Peter finally did. A recent book entitled Blood Letters, the story of Lin Shu, tells of a young woman educated, oh yes, in one of those Methodist schools established by those missionaries. She became a member of the Communist Party and then saw the tyranny of Mao Zedong she drew on her Christian education, her Christian faith, and spoke against that tyranny. While in prison for years, she would write notes and send them out. Uh, she was encouraging other believers in China. They took away her papers and her pens, and do you know what she did? She would tear pieces of bed sheet, and she would prick her finger and use her hair to write letters. That's why this book is entitled Blood Letters. She is now regarded as a great Christian martyr. She was killed in 1968. And to this day, thousands of Chinese Christians seek to go to her burial place to honor her. The authorities will not let them in. The Andersons had left China two decades earlier, but their witness and Lin Chu's witness continues. There are so many others. The people of the French Huguenot community of Les Chambon in the Second World War in France, they helped hide and rescue more than 3,500 Jews, mostly children from the Nazi onslaught. This morning I think of others that may not be as well known but I think of the sacrifices made by Sunday school teachers in this congregation who work with our children. I think of those in the 
in the fish and loafs, food ministry. I think of the choir and the commitment that you've given to help us with worship. I think of the amazing one from this congregation who made a generous gift to those who suffered great loss in Paradise, California. And I think of all of you and the gifts that you make in that regard. I also think of people you don't know, like Frances Neighbors, who saw that every child in her core city congregation received a gift on their birthday. Or Wayne Martin, who started a bingo game in the local jail where the sheriff and guards were asked to play along with the prisoners. I think of Margaret Hadley, who started a tutoring program and worked in it for 30 years. I don't remember anything else that Mrs. Anderson said on that Sunday, now more than 40 years ago, but I remember her vibrancy. She was truth all tied up in a person. It was a joy just to behold her. The quote, don't stoop to be a queen, I heard often growing up. It was part of the uh, underpinning of my Christian college but I didn't ever really understand it until Mrs. Anderson spoke that day and I recognized truth all wrapped up in human flesh. It was a statement of an awareness that people of faith are called not just to a fact but to a truth that continues to transcend our world. In the name of Jesus Christ, the King of all creation, amen. We continue to worship by giving to God our tithes and our offerings. I invite the ushers to come forward.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God, who has given us so much, here and now we offer our gifts in thanksgiving for the bounty we have received. Give us the grace to reflect your love for us back to the world in the ways we join common cause with others. May our hearts rejoice in the opportunity to share your gifts with the world. Amen. And now we join the choir in singing, Ride on, O King of Glory. We may not hit an A flat, but we mean it. And so may you go in peace. And may the love of God and the fellowship of the, Lord, of the Holy Spirit and the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you from this place as you are being redeemed. Amen.
Thank you, Javon. Lovely. Welcome, everyone. You survived Thanksgiving. Elaine and I survived four grandkids, and uh, it was a great time for us. Although I uh, brought them, they wanted to see the church. They've had to fly out earlier this morning, but uh, they wanted to see the church, so on Friday we came. I uh, wrote a text to our facilities manager indicating we would be here, and I knew there was danger of an alarm going off. And you don't want four grandchildren running in the sanctuary when the system's alarmed. I nearly had to call Peter to get out of jail. Uh, actually, uh, it was a lovely uh, time with them, and they appreciated the beauty of this place that you all care for so well. Uh, we want to welcome you if you're visiting with us. Uh, after the service, you can go out here on the patio, and there'll be someone who can speak with you about uh, being a visitor and help you know more about the church. Uh, we also encourage you to find the little card there in the pew, uh, the Connect With Us card, and would you fill it in, give us your information uh, about who you are so we'll know you were here today. And on the back side, there's a place for prayer requests. Um, altar flowers today, there was a little mix-up last Sunday, so we're going to uh, read them twice. Uh, and uh, Demi says she should be blamed, but I'll take the uh, credit as well. Uh, on November 18th, the altar flowers were given by Ken Asik and Sher Sherry Carroll in honor of their 25th wedding anniversary on November 20th and by Joanna Fuller and Dan Fuller in honor of the 50th anniversary of their parents, Keith and Gail Fuller. And then today, uh, the altar flowers are given by Roger Sheriff in memory of his wife, Margaret, who died November 26th, five years ago, and by Dick, Dick and Jerry Imers in memory of Dick's mother, Helene Garrett, who died on November 9. I thanked Dick and Jerry for them last week, and they wondered uh, if I had lost my marbles, but uh, it was just, we were a week off, so thank you all very much. Uh, prayer quilts today are for John Herman and Mary Zawadzki, and we have a very special announcement now that comes from the Pastor Parish Relations Committee, and I'm going to ask Bonnie Swartz if she would share. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Our Pastor Parish Relations Committee <clears throat> thanks all of you for all your thoughtfully crafted responses we've received to date. Uh, your comments have been summarized with a detail and provided to the bishop. He has greatly appreciated our suggestions. Bishop Hagia will be looking nationally for the very best person available who is in sympathy with our Wesleyan traditions and who brings leadership qualities needed to serve First Church in the years ahead. Currently, the bishop is in the process of reaching out to colleague bishops, national church leaders, and others to identify such persons with significant leadership potential. Early in the new year, the PPRC, bishop and district superintendent, will engage in careful consultation as to the attributes of our desired next pastor, the direction and opportunities emerging in the life of the congregation, and how to work with the bishop in a consultative fashion during this time of discernment. Potential future pastors will not be preaching before the congregation prior to appointment. At the recommendation of the bishop, the potential new lead pastor will meet with the PPRC. Following a successful meeting with PPRC, an announcement will be made by the bishop, followed by an appointment and introduction to the congregation. This may occur in late winter or early spring. Our new lead pastor will be officially appointed to our church at the annual conference in June and will begin the appointment July 1st, 2019. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie, and thanks to the work of the Pastor Parish Relations Committee. Uh, we want to remind you that next weekend, Sunday afternoon at 7 o'clock and Monday afternoon at 7 o'clock, you'll uh, be able to hear the uh, 
performance of Handel's Messiah, Christmas. And uh, this only happens every five years or so. Uh, symphony, the whole, sh it's, a, it's a, yeah, you don't want to miss it. A great thing. Next Sunday at 7 o'clock. Uh, we also need some ushers, if you want, would be willing to help then and or on Christmas Eve, just let the church office know. Um, some good news, I've learned uh, just on Friday that we are now 90% to our goal for a stewardship campaign. Uh, as Jason Tucker said to me, we're in the red zone, we're on the 10-yard line, we're going to carry it in now. So those of you that uh, haven't yet made a pledge, if you wish to do so, please do. It's important we receive those, th those this week because next weekend there are two meetings where we'll be working with our budget. Uh, on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, the church council will be meeting in the Cove, and uh, they'll be looking at the budget and also some other uh, uh, program opportunities for the church. Then on Sunday the 2nd of December in the afternoon at 12.30 in the Cove again will be the Charge Conference. And at the Charge Conference, we'll also look at the budget, look at support for our clergy, and uh, be electing uh, some folks to various posts that are now vacant in our church leadership. So next weekend is a busy weekend. Uh, Saturday morning, church council at nine o'clock, Sunday, uh, following this service at 12.30 in the Cove will be our charge conference. Well, it's that time again. Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. Would you stand and share the peace of Christ with your neighbors? How would you remain standing as the choir opens our worship with the introit?
Please join me in the invocation. Thou who art over us, thou who art one of us, thou who art. Give me a pure heart that I may see thee, a humble heart that I may hear thee, a heart of love that I may serve thee, a heart of faith that I may abide in thee. Amen. Amen. The beautiful prayer quilts on the chancel rail are for John Herman and Mary Zawadzki. The quilts will be out on the plaza after the service. I invite you to stop by, tie a knot, and say a prayer even if you do not know the recipients. I invite you into a time of prayer. Bountiful and loving God, we come to you in gratitude 
for those who give unselfishly of themselves. We are grateful for all those visiting us this morning, for the voices of the choir, for the care of our church leaders, and for the love of our church community. May this love flow to John and Mary, and may their prayer quilts be warm reminders of our heartfelt goodwill. Lord, we seek you today. You provide for all our wants, yet we are anxious about so many things. We come before you in thanksgiving, but we worry about the world around us. It seems we confront new crises each day, unfathomable acts of violence, natural disasters, economic uncertainty. We celebrate our freedoms, our country, and our abundance, but it is tempered with unease about our future. We ask you to comfort those whose lives have been altered by tragedy, for those who have lost homes, businesses, or loved ones in recent wildfires. We pray they find hope and healing in the knowledge that you will provide. Reassure and sustain those who are grieving. For our first responders, firefighters, and those involved in relief efforts, we pray they may be kept safe as they work to restore calm and assist those in need. God of grace, we thank you for the gift of families. We are grateful for the joy and love that they bring into our lives. We ask that you provide special protection for those who face hardships as they move in search of a better life. Show mercy to those who travel in danger and lead them to a place of safety and peace. As we see news of refugees and migrants around our world, Help us to remember the Holy Family's flight to Egypt so that we might see your suffering in the suffering of all migrant families. Give us the courage to welcome every stranger as Christ in our midst. May they find a friend in us and so make us worthy of the refuge we have found in you. We are quick to excuse ourselves for not giving all, not helping others, not serving you. We recognize our failings, Lord. Lift these burdens from us that we might rise to you. Lift us and lead us, Lord, to those in need of your loving and healing presence. Lead us out to minister to people. Use us to touch the lives of those who are suffering. Great Redeemer, renew us in your light and love. Guide us to use our time, our talents, and our treasure in service to others, that we may multiply your blessings. Let this be the true measure of our thanksgiving. We ask these things as we join our voices in the prayer Jesus taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation.
Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as your scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. We invite you to stand as you are comfortable for the gospel, which is from the 18th chapter of the book of John, beginning with the 33rd verse. Then Pilate in, it, <clears throat> entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? 
After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now, Barabbas was a bandit. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. You may be seated. Aren't we blessed by the music here? My goodness. Um, at the first service, or the nine o'clock service, I asked Timmy what the note was he hit. I, I guessed uh, G, and he said no, it was an A flat. And uh, so much for my perfect pitch. But uh, we are indeed blessed, and we thank you, Stan, and choir for your work. Would you bow with me as we pray together? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It's a 2,000-year-old question, and it still awaits your answer this morning. It's the question Pilate asks of Jesus what is truth? And the response that Jesus gives? Well, silence. Nothing. No response recorded. As Frederick Beekner notes, Jesus doesn't answer Pilate's question. He just stands there. Stands there stands there. Beekner goes on, contrary to the traditional view, this question is not necessarily cynical. It's possible that Pilate is asking this with a lump in his throat. Instead of truth, Pilate has only expediency as his concern. Pilate asks what is truth, and for years there have been politicians and scientists and theologians, philosophers and poets, and so on, that have tried to tell him. But the sound they make, according to Frederick Beekner, is the sound of crickets chirping. Again and again, Jesus has modeled truth. This Sunday, we call the Reign of Christ, or Christ the King Sunday. Uh, it, a little, this year, it's a little uh, different. Most years, it falls after Thanksgiving, so, or before Thanksgiving. This year, it's after Thanksgiving. And so you'll have to wait for Advent another week. And it gives us a chance 
to think of all that has led up to this story today, from the Easter story, then through Pentecost, and we've been following Jesus' ministry, and today we come to Christ the King Sunday. Again and again, Jesus shows us what it means to know the truth, to be the truth, but words are not always used. He calls Jesus, Jesus calls his followers to a life of truth. He's modeled it by healing the sick, welcoming the children, eating with sinners, and welcoming those on the margins of society to this movement. That is part of the truth. Too often, words are not matched by actions. Donald English, a British Methodist pastor, once noted, the world has enough salesmen of the gospel. What we need more of are free samples. I remember Mrs. Anderson. By the time I met her, she was in her late 70s and lost most of her eyesight. We worshiped together in a downtown congregation in Atlanta, Georgia, when I was in graduate school. Uh, it was a gift to get to know this couple, but at first I didn't realize what a gift it was. Olive Anderson was involved in everything at the church. Uh, if there was a prayer meeting, she was there. If there was a peace march, she was there. Uh, she was involved in almost any activity that any member was, even though she had difficulty with her vision. When she sang hymns, she sang lustily. Uh, she seemed to know every word of every hymn. How do I know that? Because I often stood next to her or, or behind her, and I would see her with her hymnal open to the wrong page. But she knew the words. Sometimes she had the hymnal upside down. But Olive Anderson sang with joy. The second thing I remember about her was the Sunday she spoke in worship. Until then, I did not know her story. The Andersons, you see, had spent most of their lives in China as missionaries. It is where they met as young missionaries. Olive Lipscomb and Sid Anderson were married while home on furlough in 1920. Over the years, for more than three decades, they taught, preached, ran health care programs, uh, established social outreach programs, touched tens of thousands, are you ready for this? Touched tens of thousands every week at Moore Memorial Methodist Church in Shanghai. Their ministry became the model that a guy named Bob Pierce used to develop something called World Vision. What a remarkable gift they were Mrs. Anderson stood before that congregation that Sunday morning, and she began with these words, if God calls you to be a missionary, don't stoop to be a king. And then she paused. You see, she was a bit of a feminist, and she smiled, those dim eyes sparkled somehow, and she said, or a queen. Ah. Uh, I think of them every Christ the King Sunday. The line about not stooping to be a king or a queen has been attributed to many. However, if I ever met royalty in the Jesus movement, it would have been, it would have been in part from knowing the Andersons. They were certainly a part of God's kingdom. When one met them, one had an encounter with truth at a very deep level. It was the truth of lives lived in service to Christ. We in the United States, you see, are a people who have sought to be freed of queens and kings. Our national identity is shaped by being separatists and being protesters. I recall the time I was appointed to a new parish in Indianapolis. It was a large uh, sanctuary, about this size, transepts on either side, but it was Gothic, uh, stained glass windows, beautiful stained glass windows, front and back. And my daughter and son accompanied us. This was the first time they had seen the sanctuary. And my 11-year-old son at the time marched right up the center aisle. He came and stood in the chancel quickly. He came and uh, 
stood in the pulpit and looked out at me, I was out here, and he uh, simply said, well, Dad, the Puritans wouldn't have liked this very much. You heard the report from Bonnie Swartz this morning. The Pastor Parish Relations Committee has been collecting the characteristics and attributes desired of the next lead pastor for this congregation. Thank you for the thoughtful responses you have provided. Uh, some of them are a little contradictory. You have asked, for instance, for someone with, who is young with 30 years of experience. <laughs> you stop short of wanting someone who walks on water, but you do expect someone who performs miracles a dozen or so by noon each day two dozen on Sundays. There are some common attributes you note, but one of the most frequently stated in one fashion or another is that you want someone with integrity. I know the committee and the bishop are taking these suggestions seriously. Here is something else I know. It may take you a year or two or three but you will discover that whoever is the next lead pastor will not be perfect. The truth is that you'll come to love them in new ways and appreciate this person despite any flaws you discover. You see the goodness, the value, the truth is in relationship with the pastors that you have right now. One other thing I suspect many of you may have missed it may take a year or two or three, but the lead pastor will discover that, <laughs> that you're not a perfect people. <clears throat> Here's the good news. You have seven months to work on improving. <clears throat> Where there are patterns of distrust, gossip, conspiracy thinking, division, you have some time to work on those things. Jesus is silent, just stands there. He's already given the answer about truth by how he has lived. Truth is discovered in right relationships rather more than in right answers. Facts are important. Facts are stubborn things, as they say, but facts are not necessarily truth not the truth we're talking about. Facts are critical to truth, but truth moves beyond. Truth is mirrored more in relationships than it is captured in doctrine or law. As Parker Palmer tells us, in prayer I began to realize that I not only, I not only know, but I am known. Truth is relationship. It is a commitment to conversation. The hallmark of a community of truth is in its claim that the reality is a web of communal relationships, and we can know reality only by being in community with one another and with it as it unfolds. Relationships are broken in so many ways. They're past wounds we all carry. We have different histories and family backgrounds. We struggle with different demons, pain, loneliness, childhood disappointments, alcoholism, betrayal, drug abuse, ideological and political differences. Any one of those is enough to undercut the truth of establishing a web of relationships in Jesus the Christ. Palmer writes, the ancient human question, who am I, leads inevitably to an equally important question, whose am I? For there is no self outside of relationship. Truth comes in relationship to God and to Jesus. Currently in this nation, relationships are being tested there is an undercutting of the factual realities necessary to guarantee the discovery of truth in relationship. Facts alone are not truth. They're important. They must be sifted and afforded meaning in context. 
However, facts are necessary ingredients to building true and healthy relationships. Forty years ago, Hannah Arant wrote, a people that no longer can believe anything cannot make up its mind. It is deprived not only of the capacity to act, but also the capacity to think and to judge. And with such a people, you can then do what you please. Sid and Olive Anderson knew this, firsthand experience. 1943, Sid is arrested and thrown in jail. It's a prison camp run by the Japanese. They both suffered privation and separation during these years. Yet, those who knew them at the time report that there was a vibrancy that continued about them. They continued ministry wherever they were. We knew them at the end of their lives, but I can imagine them earlier. They had left behind a legacy of Christianity, of a commitment to piety and justice. Professor Carolyn Lewis of Luther Seminary notes it this way, this notion about what the realm of God is about. When kingdom is construed from the truth of relationship and not rule, from the truth of incarnation and not just location, from the truth of love and not just law, then Jesus, as the truth in our lives, will ring true. The scene of Jesus before Pilate is a poignant one. He is, has also been before the chief priests. So much for this not being political, this gospel. It is. Jesus is confronted with the struggles of the world he is in. The relationships right there. He's already modeled how to live through it. Fred Craddock says, however, that the tests before the chief priest and Pilate are not the most important trial that has happened here. He says the real trial has already occurred around a charcoal fire. Simon Peter is asked, do you know the man? Simon Peter and the church are being tried and too often found wanting. All of us are tried. All of us face this 2,000-year-old question. Mrs. Anderson shows a way forward. I think of others who choose a relationship with Christ as Peter ultimately did. A recent book, Blood Letters, the story of Lin Chu, we learn of a young woman educated in some of those same Methodist schools that the Andersons helped start, a member she was of the Communist Party, who then saw the tyranny of Chairman Mao Zedong. She drew on her Christian faith, on her Christian education. She spoke against that tyranny. From prison, for many years, she would write letters Finally, her pa pencil and paper and pens were confiscated. They did not want her to influence others. She tore pieces of her bed sheet off and wrote. How did she write? She pulled hairs from her head and pricked her finger and took the blood. Hence the book's name, Blood Letters. Even though she was martyred in 1968, Lin Chu's Influence continues throughout China. Thousands want to go to her graveside, but the authorities won't permit it. You see, there is truth that extends beyond the control of certain facts. I think of so many others, not only the Andersons who left their witness in China decades earlier than Lin Chao, but others, oh, the French Huguenots in Les Chambon in the Second World War in France, who hid and rescued more than 3,500 Jews, mostly children from the Nazi onslaught. And there are others, many of them here, you don't know about them all. There are Sunday school teachers who sacrificed to teach children in this congregation. There are those who take time away for the loaves and fishes ministry. There is the choir who faithfully comes and leads us and there is the amazing generosity of one from this church 
who this, this last week gave an astonishing gift to those who suffered from the fires in paradise. Did you see that? The generous gift given by a member of this church. But there's so many others. <laughs> I think of people you may not know, probably don't. Francis Neighbors, a humble school teacher who decided that no child in that church or neighborhood should have a birthday without a gift from Francis. And so she saw that that happened. I think of Margaret Hadley, who started a tutoring program and worked in it for 30 years. I think of Wayne Martin, who decided he would have a jail ministry by playing bingo in the jail with the prisoners, and he would always invite the sheriff and the guards to join them. Building of relationships, you see. I don't remember anything else Mrs. Anderson said on that Sunday now more than 40 years ago, but I remember her vibrancy. She was a truth tied up in a person, and it was a joy to behold. The quote, don't stoop to be a queen, I had heard often before, but I had never really seen it wrapped up in human flesh like I did that morning. It was a statement of an awareness that the people of faith are called to a service of the highest of all truths, to the truth that Jesus the Christ is the king of all creation. Amen. We continue now with morning worship through our tithes and offerings. I invite the ushers to come forward to wait on us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. 
God, who has given us so much, here and now we offer our gifts in thanksgiving for the bounty we have received. Give us the grace to reflect your love for us back to the world in the ways we join common cause with others. May our hearts rejoice in the opportunity to share your gifts with the world. Amen. And now, may the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you from this place, remembering the great gift of King Jesus, who continues in our lives as we are being redeemed. Amen. <laughs>